Okay, well, hello everyone, welcome. Uh, so on behalf of the Havens Right Center for Social Justice, thank you so much for being in virtual community with us today. My name is Sarah Gia Trungone, and I'm one of the project assistants for the center, along with my colleague, Pete Ramond. So it's our great pleasure to begin our spring visiting scholar lecture series today with Professor Stephen Graham of Newcastle University. Before I turn things over to Revel Sims, who will introduce Stephen, I'd just like to briefly outline the format for today's event and some Zoom housekeeping matters. So Stephen will speak for approximately 50 minutes to an hour, after which we'll have roughly 30 minutes for questions. We ask that you please turn off your camera during Stephen's talk to preserve bandwidth in case of connectivity issues. Once we begin the question and answer period, you're welcome to activate your camera and microphone to ask a question directly, or you can submit a question through the chat, which I'll happily read aloud. So this session will be recorded and posted to our website, which is Haven's Right Center with a W at wisc.edu. We do encourage you to share the recording with friends and colleagues when it's made available. But rest assured, as a participant, you will not be recorded unless you choose to activate your camera and ask a question. So with that, I'll hand things over to Revel. Hi, can you all hear me? All right. Um, so I'm honored to be able to present to you all today, Professor Stephen Graham. Uh, he's a professor of cities and society at the Global Urban Research Unit at Newcastle's uh, School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape. Professor Graham holds degrees in geography, planning, and uh, the sociology of technology. He has authored and co-authored a wide range of academic articles, as well as a variety of influential books covering very generally the interface between rapidly expanding technological apparatus and the production of urban space that interrogates subjects such as war, conflict, and violence, surveillance, sanitation systems, built in imaginary spaces, networked, and of course, splintering urbanism. Uh, his work includes influential contributions with his early co-author, Simon Marvin, uh, Telecommunications in the City, 1996, The Influential Splintering Urbanism, 2001. Uh, Professor Graham also has contributed significant edited volumes, including The Cyber Cities Reader, 2004, Cities, War, and Terrorism, also from 2004, as well as the prescient 2009 intervention, Disrupted Cities When Infrastructures Fail. Can't help but think about that in terms of what's happening in Texas right now. Um, his more recent at, at work has deepened, no pun intended, our understanding of the production of urban space and brought critical attention to particular aspects regarding not only the technological reorganization of city space, but also processes of de- and re-territorialization into new spaces of urban control and function in works such as Cities Under Siege, The New Military Urbanism, 2010, and most recently, Vertical, The City from Satellites to Bunkers. Assembled together, these works address the radical transformations occurring around us. His work on military urbanism in particular draws attention to the rescaling of spaces of contestation away from nation states and toward global systems of urban surveillance, picking up where previous scholars like Mike Davis left off, moving us away from the ecology of fear to patterns of urbanization and tech-based accumulation strategies that are more fully integrated into the production of a militarized hyper-surveilled mode of urban development. At the same time, his concept of military urbanism destroyed the assumed sort of temporality of previous discourses that dominated his field, like the notion of an industrial complex where state subsidies lead to military obligations that eventually find themselves in commodities for consumption. On the contrary, military urbanism describes how technological innov innovation originates in a complex field of actors where locating the birth and iteration, as well as the commodification of militarized technologies, is decentered with an industrial milieu of firms and government actors that often work symbiotically in real time and global urban space, rather than sequentially over and through nation state boundaries. Looking back, the work was a logical precursor to his recent attempts to conceptualize the verticalization of urban space, both upward to orbiting satellites and downward in ways that highlight shifts towards extractive imperialism and other extensions into the subterranean space that complicate our urban spatial sensibilities. Indeed, across these contributions, Professor Graham's work unsettles the assumed spatiality of his consistent themes of urbanized conflict, power, and capital, and we are encouraged to imagine new ways of visualizing the bewildering forms that simultaneously stretch and splinter urban space. 
His work furthermore asked that we project these propositions and challenge our urban imaginary by rendering how this global networked, splintered, militarized and vertical urbanism might look like in visual form. To use a decidedly flat metaphor, what would an urban ecology look like in three dimensions? And how might sociologists, planners, and even geographers imagine these spatial relationships and forms of urbanization? And with that, I'm excited to turn it over to Professor Graham, who will present to us the vertical succession of the elites, understanding urban polarization in three dimensions. Thank you very much, Professor Graham. Thank you so much, Ravel, and thank you, Sarah. Um, I really appreciate the invitation to, um, to speak today. It's, it's uh, a real honor to have the opportunity. I only wish I could do it face to face, but uh, needs must, as we, uh, as we, as we know. Um, what I want to do today is to problematize um, a particular form of secession of the elites. It's a long standing debate in sociology and urban studies, um, which surrounds social polarization and the, the ways in which powerful and wealthy minorities uh, remove themselves from, from the wider society. What I want to position, argue, what I want to argue today is that this is going on in a three-dimensional way, which traditional modes of understanding um, urban, in urban studies are, are, are struggling to deal with, partly because we have quite flat histories in the way we imagine and conceptualize urban space. So I'm kicking off with this staggering view from one of the penthouse apartments of one of the most notorious of these emerging super skinny, super luxury towers. This, this, this apartment went for about $80 million on construction. I think it's, it's called 432 Park. Um, I think it's well over 120 million now in, in its value. Um, the starting point really is that we're struggling with this verticalization of elite secession because we have a flat inheritance in terms of our social scientific traditions of thinking about social inequality, thinking about um, social segregation. Whether we talk about the, the famous maps of Charles Booth, this is on the right here, or classic um, social geography maps of uh, inequality in Chicago, or classic uh, renditions of cities into structural forms. We, we, our tradition is, is a top-down cartographic godlike gaze, which paradoxically renders the city as a flat surface, as a uni-surfaced phenomenon. And this horizontalism is, is only now really being, being dealt with through a, 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 ra a rapid sort of verticalization and volumetric shift in, in how we think about the politics of urban space. Personally, I've got a geographical background, urban geography and urban planning, as, as you heard there. And it strikes me that geography very traditionally was deemed to be the study of the Earth's surface, which by definition is a, is a phenomenon that struggles to deal with anything above or below the Earth's surface. One particular um, type of understanding of the choreographies of life in uh, geography called time geography, which derives from Swedish scholar Hagerstrand, um, represents daily schedules like this okay you, this is an average daily schedule of someone moving around the city what's very telling is that these vertical lines are actually just where people are staying put so this this conceptual model cannot actually deal with the idea of people moving up and down vertically at all so it's a big it's a big uh, challenge to move from this horizontal tradition the horizontal tradition means that there is virtually no literature at all in the history of social sciences, as far as I'm aware anyway, on the history of vertical social inequalities or vertical segregation, despite the fact that there, there is a rich history here. We, we can go right back to cross sections of Haussmannian um, tenement blocks in Paris with uh, different segregated groups of very, very poor people living at the top, because in those days there were no electric elevators, there was often no running water, so it's a really bad place to be, was in the Chambre de Bonne, they call them, in the Parisian context. Um, the bourgeoisie would be inhabiting the middle, middle stories, and of course the famous uh, 
under underground sort of basements would be would be the servant class. So there is a rich history here. Um, it's just a very poorly researched history. Um, there is, however, now a, a shift to much more fully uh, address the three dimensional politics of urban space. And I've contributed through through this book that that um, that Revel was talking about. Um, I, an image that I start the book with is, is taken from Pierre Ballinger, who's a landscape architect at Harvard. And he has this incredibly powerful sectional view of, of a sort of the politics of, of city space going right up to orbital sensors and platforms and aircraft and so on. This would be the landscape of the verticalizing city itself with all sorts of subterranean infrastructures, resource grabs and, and so on. And the, the sectional view is obviously very important if we're starting to think powerfully about vertical secession of, of, of elites. A problem that emerges because of this horizontalist tradition in critical urban thinking is that there's an orthodox policy uh, paradigm, if you like, has started to take a dominant position, I would say, in the planning and the real estate management of many cities around the world. And this draws from the likes of Ed Glazer, the, the, the urban economist at Harvard, in uncritically seeing um, tall high-rise housing as, as, a, as a beneficial development in cities. I mean, Glazer actually suggests that skyscrapers can save the city. Um, this is a, um, an idea that you build lots of central condo towers as a means of liberating housing crises, as a means of supplying vast new numbers of housing units, which in classic economic terms will lower prices and make, make them much more, um, make housing more affordable, more central, more sustainable, because it's, it's a central growth driven around walkability rather than sprawl and auto use and so on. So it's a seductive idea that you build high um, to address housing crises, okay? Um, Glazer basically argues that too many cities are protected by in aspic through urban conservation planning. And he suggests that um, we need to remove height restrictions to have a central boom of uh, how high rise housing. It's a, as I say, a, an idea that um, combines with notions of smart growth, sustainability, the improvement of public finances in city centers and so on. But also it's very much um, feeding into the sort of spectacle economy where many city elites see towers and skyscrapers as the signifier of their global status, their global ambitions. As Iwa Ong says, the idea of worlding very much centers on having tall central skylines. The problem really is that this orthodoxy is basically facilitating a vast growth of extremely expensive, what I call luxified, towers. These are far away from the idea of democratically accessible, um, financially affordable housing. In the absence of controls over rents, um, in the absence of powerful social housing traditions in many cities with the privatization and neoliberalization of many of these, um, tr these traditions, um, these are elite condos that are being built as tradable commodities, perfect for the speculatively inclined as Paul Goldberger. So under the shimmer of, of that idea of walkable, smart, sustainable, um, affordable housing, what we're getting instead is a, a high rise luxury phenomenon where elites are building and enjoying vastly expensive housing units. And what I want to do in, in, the, in my talk, the rest of my talk today is to explore these in, in much more detail. I think at the same time, we have to combine our treatment of the, the rise of luxury towers with the ways in which many inheritances of the modernist social housing 
vertical housing traditions in North America and uh, Europe in particular are, have been erased and have been erased um, violently in, in many cases, partly um, based on many, many um, cases, the sort of wholesale demonization of the very idea of tall, high rise housing for social for social uses. Um, very often the successes and there are very many successes of high rise social housing are forgotten and there is a, um, a demonization of the very idea and this this comes from Ed Glazer as well. Ed Glazer says the combination of height and social disorder can be very, very bad. Um, so he criticizes the very idea of, of vertical social housing as, as a sort of intrinsically and essentially in, inevitably going to fail. Um, the, many of these estates were poorly maintained. They suffered because of deindustrialization of, of labor markets. They, they engaged with, they struggled with problems of structural racism, poor investment, poor infrastructure, poor design. Um, but the ones that are good are often very good. And the problem is that those successes are, are um, often overlooked in, in the rush to demonize all high rise social housing. The classic uh, example would be, and I should have said that the, the image there is the iconic and infamous moment where Pretty Go, the, the huge project of housing project in St. Louis um, was demolished. A moment that David Harvey actually uh, highlighted as a sort of moment, the sort of birth pangs of post-modernity. Pretty Go um, is a classic case of how uh, social housing per se has been demonized as, 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 um, as, as Maya, um, I can't even see her name here, my, ex my excuse, my, <laughs> my, uh, um, as Maya discusses in this quote here, she, she argues that the, the myths of social housing being inevitably wrong are manufactured as a neoliberal convenience, the dismal reputation of public housing, she, she argues, um, pushes the idea that there's an irrevocable dysfunction to, to the housing, despite the fact that as Purity Go and many other um, high-rise housing um, developments failed um, because of wider structural changes, deindustrialization, structural racism, um, and, and so on not necessarily because of the essential qualities of the buildings themselves. So let's have a look at a few examples of these forests of luxury towers. And um, I want to start with Vancouver, because Vancouver has become a sort of emblematic of this central condo phenomenon. Um, Vancouver has been rebuilt as a forest of well, the central part of Vancouver has been rebuilt as a forest of glass, aluminium, um, concrete towers, very much fueled by financial investments coming in from Asia. And Jamie Peck and colleagues at UBC talk, talk about this winning combination of density, livability and sustainability as the way this model of, of building was, was solved. But again, um, as in the other cases, this is not um, about addressing housing crisis. In fact, the housing crisis in Vancouver have got worse with this vast supply of new, of new condos. Why? Because they are very, very expensive and they are being owned often as by, by offshore elites, um, often Asian elites. So they talk about the subsequent commodification of these, these condos and um, the way they become sort of tradable commodities in, in terms of speculative investments and very often their investments distant and overseas um, far off investments so in many cases they're not even housing people at all they just sit there as as investments for capital so many of these luxury high-rise towers in a way they house capital more than they house people and this has fueled the the sense that vancouver is emerging to some extent as a resort economy. It's actually a, a global city, but the economy is not that strong. So it's, it's no way on its own it could sustain this huge investment in real estate. What's happened is that the political economy of real estate has become Vancouver's main industry, um, fueled by this resort investment where a, a lot of Asian uh, elites come in and use Vancouver basically as a 
as a pleasant and beautiful place to come and have vacations and um, which is not in any way helpful for addressing the wider housing crisis in Vancouver which has some of the most expensive housing compared to a relatively weak labor market in the whole of North America. Central and Midtown Manhattan is a second example I want to emphasize again perhaps the most visible of all of these uh, of the new morphology of uh, super luxury towers because in Manhattan what you're getting is basically the, the tall skinnies these are staggeringly tall quite a few of them are now taller than the empire state and they've been pushed up with star architect names and so on and what's staggering about these is they are stacks of single apartments they are basically offering four walls of stunning views over the staggering landscape of manhattan and it's what uh, rafael vinoli the architect for this most notorious tower the 432 park calls the logic of luxury. Um, Paul Goldberg has actually done some critical research on these. And he says, um, many of these towers are put up not so much to house people or businesses as to give rich Indians, Russians, Iranians, and Southeast Asians a place to park some cash away from nosy local governments. So in a world where there's a lot of surplus capital flying around, um, the real estate um, markets, particularly of London and New York, always do incredibly well. And London and New York have both um, experienced vast growths of these super skinny towers. Um, the skyline of central Manhattan is, is certainly midtown Manhattan, is being radically shaped by these, these architectural forms. And as I say, these, these are not density these are not high density housing they might you might think this surely must be high density housing but given that each one of those floors is a single apartment what you're seeing actually is incredibly low density housing um smack bang in the middle where um it, in the middle of central manhattan here's an example of one of the bigger apartments in 432 park where you've got the entire floor um, given over to one 700 meter apartment. So this is a very long way from sort of Ed Glazer's vision of building high to offer low, in, low affordable, affordable housing. It's about as far away from that logic as possible. And in terms of urban design, um, what happens in New York is that you have something called transferable development rights or air rights um, attached through city ordinances to each parcel of land. And what developers are doing is buying up um, several parcels of land and they're able to stack the development light rights volumetrically on top of each other um, so that they can build these, these incredibly tall towers. Um, and this means that the, the city, actually the city con council actually has very little input into the sort of urban design of these things. Um, there's even uh, debates about the fact that some of the uh, some of the floors are made deliberately tall and deliberately big to actually push up the height of the resulting tower, which is a huge asset in selling these super luxury apartments because you can brag about the height and the, the vertical height of these things is obviously a huge part of their, their draw, a huge part of their status, a huge part of their their um, elite attractiveness. Um, so the apartments have, on the top of some of these towers, as I say, have these a staggering jaw-dropping views, which are central to their, 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 uh, their attractiveness, of course. And Paul Goldberger talks about the fact that you've got the four um, walls of these apartments taking in all directions of, of Manhattan. And bear in mind, you're actually higher than the Empire State at this point, um, with the open vistas leading in all directions. And we've seen the image of one of the views already. There is a, an interesting emerging story that um, it highlights that perhaps the allure of the super elite secessionary existence is uh, it's not quite um, meeting up with expectations for some of the super rich residents when they are residents but bear in mind there's quite a lot of absentee owners for these as well um, the towers actually have to sway 
in the, in the tall wind. That's how engineers and architects make sure that they are safe, actually. Um, so the swaying actually creates creaks and noises and so on. It sometimes interrupts. There's been some water leaks in the in these in 432 Park. Some of the elevators haven't been working. And of course, you are completely at the mercy of elevators in these towers, like in all high rise buildings. If the elevator fails, you're in serious trouble, as we'll see later in, in the talk. The actual um, service charges that you, you are being charged have gone through the roof because the insurance premiums have, have gone up massively with all of these problems as well. So there's a, there's a sense of uh, a backlash on the sort of billionaire's row as this area of Midtown Manhattan is called these days. Um, the backlash is emerging against the phenomenon of the super skinny towers as well. Of course, how New York housing crises uh, roll on with the with characteristic intensity and there's a powerful sense and a powerful um, sense of contestation against the, the the billionaire row phenomenon there's even a sense that the the actual light of central park is being stolen um, because of the shadows of these towers where inequality is literally blocking out the sky as one one author said there's also a sense that this, many of the owners of these apartments are untraceable. Uh, they're often owned through shell companies in offshore financial enclaves. They're often uh, housed, they're often bought through dirty money that's been laundered or that's come from environmental or social uh, abuse in global south um, locations through oligarchs and elites and so on. So the New York Times have have been repeatedly trying to find a way to penetrate the secrecy in terms of looking at, it's a bit like in London as well, as we'll see, looking at where this money comes from, you know, where does this uh, surplus capital that arrives in built form in Manhattan actually um, um, originate? I think another, another point that emerges when you start to look at in three dimensions at um, social inequality is that there's a there's a powerfully an important um, surface of, of the building that's virtually ignored in in urban planning and urban and architecture discussions and that's the roofscape because again um, as many uh, as the logic of many of these towers and luxury um, buildings is to basically remove the population from the street. So the, the plinth on the top or the, the top of the podium of, or the top of the roof becomes a privatized luxury um, place for elite services and elite. And here you see an image of uh, one rooftop um, pool club that um, the fabulous photographer Alex McLean used on the cover of his book, uh, up on the roof. So um, I would stress that a vertical perspective on social inequality means that we have to take the roof scape very seriously as, as a space of luxury and habitation. Um, just some more, some more examples, I think, uh, coming up. Many of these towers provide a sense of serene, secure, luxury removal from the ground, from the remainder of the city. Um, and that's a, a, another key part of the selling and the marketing of these, these apartments, as I'll display at some point in this soon. The infinity pool is, is another sort of icon that's emerging in many of these towers, not just the pool, the collective pool, but the, the pool that actually um, provides the sort of liminal link to the city beyond the city a spectacle the city is as a landscape to be voyeuristically consumed and the most famous uh, infinity pool um, at the moment is the marina bay the three towered development um, resort complex and casino complex in singapore let's look at london london's a slightly different case to new york um, but it is um, a similar a similar in, in the sense that we're having a huge supply of vertical luxury housing, which is making no difference whatsoever to the intensifying housing crisis of the wider city. Um, London's uh, mayors over the years have, have 
radically um, liberalized restraints on height. There's been a sense that London can import a new style. This is a new architectural style. London hasn't got a tradition of skyscrapers to be, apart from a few corporate HQs in the finance district. So over the last 20 years, the, the morphology of London has been transformed as spectacularly as any time in its history through the sprouting of luxury towers marketed in very much the same ways as those in Vancouver or, um, or New York. Um, what's going on in London though is, is perhaps more violent because what very often the inheritances of modernist social housing, um, as you can see here, this is the Aylesbury estate on the South Bank, is often being violently um, torn away. It's, it's, it's being privatized, um, often poorly maintained, and often the council housing, which is what's, le what's left of it, is actually being um, violently destroyed in what some people are calling the London clearances because it literally is a violent clearing of working class communities um, on the back of so-called regeneration, which basically is replaced by luxury housing with a very, very small contribution of what's called affordable housing as part of the planning um, agreements when affordable housing is not affordable for many people at all. So we're seeing um, the inner urban estates of London. Um, this is another example, often demolished, often um, with literally the, the dispersal of the, of the communities, the forcible dispersal of the communities. Many of these areas of land have even been designated brownfield sites um, by, by local government, even though they are existing housing communities. And the attempts by progressive architects, progressive geographers, social movements of various sorts to say, look, um, these are fully, um, fully functioning estates. They can be modified, they can be densified through creative um, new new programs to be very, very important areas of affordable housing in the city. Those are falling on deaf ears. I mean, there's an amazing group called Architecture for Social Housing, ASH in London, suggesting, you know, new programs of creatively upgrading these inherited estates to pr provide really fantastic social housing spaces. But very rarely are these being carried out because the land is so valuable. Uh, potentially for speculatively orientated luxury estates and luxury towers. Even more tragic has been the the real the real terrible um, disaster of the fire in Grenfell, where um, this is a where it emerged that the tower itself, a classic example of sort of privatized um, social housing that that was badly managed, badly maintained, and even more terribly. Um, it was actually clad with the very, very dangerous um, type of ACM cladding, um, not necessarily to improve the conditions of the people in the tower, but to improve the aesthetic appeal of the tower for the surrounding wealthy neighborhood. And there's a big inquiry going on into the, the tragedy as we speak. Some of the remaining modernist towers in London are preserved and they are listed, which means that they can't be demolished. And there's a few iconic structures, most notably two by this famous socialist architect, um, Erno Goldfinger. Um, many people reckon that the architect in J.G. Ballard's high rise was based, was loosely based on Goldfinger. But two of his towers have been listed, uh, Trellick Tower and, and Bolfin Tower. Um, but, but again, in, in, in the sense now they are privatized and there's been a sort of um, radical up shift towards upscale housing. These have been refurbished, but they're now highly expensive owner occupied spaces and they're being um, commodified and aestheticized because of their urban cool. You know, you can now get t-shirts and cushions and, and so on. Um, because the brutalist uh, concrete tradition is very, very fashionable amongst, well, largely architects, um, design literate um, elites. Um, so these are now housing huge numbers of, of wealthy design orientated elites rather than the, the, the low income groups that they were built for. Um, even more staggering in London, uh, 
a remnant of one of the demolished estates, the um, Robin Hood Gardens, which was very controversially demolished uh, a couple of years ago, was actually taken to the Venice, Venice Biennale um, and is now going to be placed in the, the um, Victoria and Albert Museum in, in London um, as a centerpiece for their 1950s display. So there's a sort of museumization of some of the violently destroyed remnants of the social housing boom, which is staggering in some ways. Um, in London, we're seeing uh, a bit like New York, many of these super luxury towers. This is just a map of some of them. They're pretty much um, going down the river. There's a big bunch of them around Canary Wharf, the new finance district, big bunch of them around the city of London and, and so on. Um, and you see the sort of CGI renderings of these clusters of small towers. They're all sort of designed to look different. They have different star architects. The, the, the obsession is to make them iconograph iconographically in, independent of the others and identifiable from the others. Um, again, there's a lot of evidence that these are owned by shell companies very often um, with dirty money behind the investments as well, a bit like New York. Um, so we've got the experience in Vancouver, we've got the experience in New York and London. Um, in some global south cities, uh, we are seeing an, another phenomenon of luxury, luxury housing. Um, there's been some fabulous work done by anthropologists, uh, Kevin Lewis O'Neill and Benjamin Fogarty Venezuela in Guatemala City, and they've actually studied the, the emergence of these uh, luxury central towers that are very often now housing Guatemala's elite. They're not necessarily, they used to go off into secure gated communities in the suburbs or the periphery. Now they're in these secure um, luxury towers in the center where they inhabit the sort of higher spaces of the plinth and the, and the roof as a secure sense of privilege. And as they say, the experience of looking up at privilege and, and of looking down on the masses now defines this register in Guatemala City. Um, this is the, the, the classic sort of secure high-end um, landscaped plinth experience that they talk about. Um, but in Guatemala City, of course, it's the barrier which presents the other. The, the, the shanty, the self-built city is, is, is what surrounds these towers. And you get similar logics in places like Sao Paulo and Rio, where it's the favelas or the barrios that provides the other. And one, reg one resident of one of the towers here that said, was quoted as saying, the lower you go, the more dangerous it gets. So you get a sort of verticalized language uh, registering class and othering as in this horror, vertically segmented and segregated landscape. As I say, in Sao Paulo, you have a similar logic. This is a famous photograph of some of the uh, securitized uh, luxury uh, condo developments in central, in Morumbi area of Sao Paulo with the security perimeter and then the, the favela in the uh, beyond. So stark landscapes of social polarization. Perhaps the most staggering single example um, of the phenomenon, I think, is, uh, is in Mumbai. And Mumbai is another city that's been transformed by um, elite luxury high-rise housing developments in the center of town. One of these towers looks like a, you know, a mass condo development for perhaps two, two or 300 people, but it actually is a single family home. Um, it's the family, of, it's the family home of the Ambani family, the India's richest family. And it took a while for, for Mumbai, Mumbai's residents to, to register that this was a single housing unit. And as Vikram doctor says, at some point, the penny dropped for everyone. The whole structure was just for one family. This surprise could be uh, how the building subtly shifts the meaning. The apartment blocks have come to acquire in, in Mumbai. Um, I, I think it's worth emphasizing, and this is my fourth point, 
the ways in which vertical architecture is used um, by city elites and by city development agencies and marketing agencies now as this symbol of worlding, the Iowa uncles worlding. Uh, there's a profound sense that um, building these sculpted towers, ideally with an identifiable, um, an instantly identifiable silhouette, whether it be the Burj Khalifa, the tallest skyscraper in the world here, or the Shard in London, um, that this adds to the sort of efforts of city elites to render and to sell their cities as, as global. As, as global cities, as places of uh, huge centrality and huge centripetal pull. Um, and the obsession with height is, is very telling. And this is another point that really hammers another criticism into the Ed Glazer argument, because many of these super tall towers, the very tallest skyscrapers in the world, um, have uh, huge parts of their top end uh, structures that are basically too skinny to be even occupied. This is what architects call vanity height. Um, in the obsession to be tall for tallness's sake, um, many of these towers have vanity heights of, in, well, in the Burj Khalifa's example here, of 244 meters. So the top 244 meters of the Burj Khalifa, which is just about to become the second tallest skyscraper in the world because there's a kilometre tall one being built in Saudi Arabia and Jeddah at the moment. So this is vanity height. So this is just machine space. This is just space to be high for its own very, very, uh, for its own purposes to be high because of the symbolic allure of this height itself. And these are other examples of skyscrapers around the world with their, with their vanity height, the areas that are basically just lift shafts and elevator shafts and machine spaces, and perhaps the odd, the odd viewing platform. So one of the um, crucial dimensions of the vertical secession of the elites, I think, is the way um, it manages linguistic registers, the way it um, exploits the very deep traditions that humans have of seeing um, upward movements as being inherently positive, being inherently pleasurable, being inherently powerful. As vertical animals, we, we, we have inherited a tradition where linguistically, um, as Yifu Tuan suggests, um, upwardness is deemed to be positive. The word low, as Stephen Kern actually says, even, even itself, the word low, um, can suggest immorality, poverty or deceit. And historically in cities, these upward and lower registers, which overlap with histories of religion, of course, um, uh, very starkly shape the experience of poverty and, and um inequality, particularly in basements and, and, and sewers and so on. As David Pike writes in his amazing work on the subterranean in Paris and London, the world above is deemed to be the world, the, the, uh, the place of law, order and economy. But um, the idea of high and low, up and down, upper and lower and north and south. And this is a hugely important part of the way these towers are marketed because they're marketed um, through vertical metaphors which imbibe owners and occupiers with status simply because they are high okay that's really important to stress um, Manuel de Seto when he in one of his works talks about the the relationship between the tower occupant and the city beyond and he was actually on the top of the world trade center when he coined this this description and he talked about the the ways that these structures lifted you um, beyond the city so you were sort of of the city but not in the city um, he says that when this is a quote when one goes up there the viewer leaves behind the mass that carries off and mixes up 
in itself any identity of authors or spectators. His elevation transfigures him into a voyeur, puts him at a distance, it transforms the bewitching world into one which one was possessed into a text that lies before one eyes. It allows one to read it to be a solar eye looking down like a god. And um, this voyeuristic sort of possession and rendering of the city as, as an aesthetic backdrop is, is, is a central part of the way these towers are marketed and sold. Um, some of the marketing is very unsubtle. This is one of the towers in central Mumbai, quite near the Ambani one single family tower, um, which is where the real estate hoardings, um, on the one hand, say, consider it a blessing to share the same address as God. Um, but also over here, which is quite telling, given that global cities in the tropics are experiencing huge heat crises, here it says the higher you go, the cooler you get. And this is the brochure for this tower. Again, the infinity pool makes an appearance um, uh, and the vertical metaphors saturate the, uh, the equating of height with power and status and superiority. And the word superiority actually has a vertical origin too. So well, if we look at the etymology of our language, it's, it's profoundly vertical in, in terms of uh, phrases about wealth, poverty, power connected to clouds and everything classy in the city look at this way way above the rest what it means to live in the sky so there's a sense that you're, you're selling an inhabitation not necessarily of the city but the sky itself you can expect your spirits to be elevated so there's loads of puns to do with vertical language these are some of the ones in london um, a cut above the rest hard to keep your feet on the ground elevate going up in the world unique on every level and so on and so forth new york has some similar examples um, perhaps the most startling uh, example of this is a is a an ad for um a, an elite housing block in london which was very very controversial it was so controversial it was taken down actually this is a red row company and it depicts this guy fighting against the sort of visceral mass of bodies in the tube and fighting through um, a sort of Darwinian workplace in the banking sector to finally succeed to the point where he buys this penthouse and um, ends up just pulling the, the drapes apart, looking out at the city. And he says, to, to succeed and is to stand with the world at your feet. So the vertical linguistic registers here are really important part of the ways in which these, these structures have been sold, marketed and uh, consumed. So there's a politics of looking down and the politics of looking down sometimes reaches almost comical levels. I mean, this is the new development around the US embassy in London where you actually have Again, the classic luxury plinth with the landscaping and high-end sort of leisure facilities. But here there's actually a pool linking the two towers, which allows you to look down below as you swim on the, uh, the rest of society. Quite staggering. Very heavily marketed uh, as the one and only sky pool. This is the new US embassy, a billion dollar structure by, by all accounts. Um, so there's a this huge effort by the real estate organizations to, to distinguish their structures with unique designs, identifiable silhouettes, star architect names, and so on. Um, and a, perhaps an even more uh, extraordinary example of the sort of politics of looking down comes from the Rio experience. And there's an extraordinary documentary um, called Um Lager a Sol, in the English title is simply High Rise. And the, the filmmaker actually managed to talk to the penthouse dwellers on the Copacabana and other coasts in Rio and um, talk to them about how, again, they, their sense of living in the sky, living by the ocean. But, but this one woman talks about looking across to the hillside favelas, which at this time were experiencing violent pacification, police raids and so on in the run up to the Olympics. And she was actually talking quite 
quite remarkably, she looked slightly sheepish when she said this, but she said, uh, we have a free fireworks display almost every day as they were watching the bullets flying around and bouncing around on the uh, favela landscapes. The final point I want to stress is that when we see verticalizing urban landscapes, we need to pay attention to vertical mobilities. And there's been a huge mobilities turn in the humanities and social sciences the last two decades, but the humble elevator has um, been completely ignored as a, as, a, as, a, as a mode of mobility. But of course, within, as I said before, within um, verticalizing structures, you are hostage to the elevator. So we can only find this out when elevators break down as they did during Hurricane Sandy's impact on New York. But in London, as we're seeing these new luxury um, high rise developments come in, the, the obligation of these developers to put in small and token numbers of so-called affordable housing is, is leading to a, another powerful example of what Simon and Marvin and I called splintering urbanism, the sense that mobility systems themselves start to be fragmented between um, elites and, 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 and low income majorities. And you're getting startling examples of these uh, in London. On the one hand, you'll have the high-end luxury uh, concierge sort of entrance spaces for the, the luxury parts of the development. Somewhere around the back end near the, um, near the waste disposal units in some dingy little alleyway, this will be the experience for those on the affordable level. And there's even been efforts to contest the, the sense that children's play areas have been out of bounds in some of these developments to people living in the, the so-called affordable. It's pretty scandalous stuff and is hugely contested in London at the moment. But the elevator itself becomes a sort of another extension of, of, of luxury and power. You're starting to even get, in some examples, um, auto elevators for high-end car owners, this is in Singapore, to actually have their Ferrari or their Porsche um, carried up to be an emblematic sort of status symbol uh, as, they not, as, as they come back to their apartments. So this is what we would call a premium network space, going back to the splintering urbanism work. But of course, um, those living in the uh, the, what's left of the modernist vertical housing um, structures often have radically different uh, experiences of, of elevators and often these are poorly maintained, they're unreliable and so on. There's been a research project in Toronto to look at the ways in which sometimes people are um, literally stranded because of inadequate and poorly maintained elevators. The same is very much the case in the Bonneau uh, on the peripheries of Paris, where just a few miles from the sort of bourgeois centre of Paris, a city which hasn't been uh, allowed to push lots of luxury housing towers because of its height constrained planning regime. Um, in, the, in some of the Paris banlieues, you're, you're having to have um, basically porters brought in for moving goods and, and food up to stranded families because private landlords uh, have not been reinstating elevators when they've, uh, when they've been failing. Um, one of the local mayors says a woman ascends slowly and silently up the stairs, bent double under the weight of a full cart. She pulls with a strap from the front. She lives on the eighth floor. We are 15 kilometers from Paris. Is this possible? So the politics of elevator mobilities is, is a really pivotal question uh, in the, the wider um, shift towards verticalized urban life. Um, that's the, the main body of what I want to say. I hope it's been uh, thought provoking, but I want to finish by perhaps putting the experience uh, and the proliferation of luxury high rise housing into a bigger context, into a bigger context where we're looking at broader techno politics of secession. Um, which is a, a wider three-dimensional field. Um, and Will Davis, a, a fabulous writer from Goldsmiths, 
talks about the sense that the super rich um, these days, it seems, cannot bear to be on the same level. There's a sense that they're abandoning ground full stop. Um, we've got the super rich towers that I've talked about here. But in London, we have the phenomenon of the super luxury basements, which are being burrowed beneath the surface. Um, uh, to create what are called iceberg houses, houses which have staggering levels of luxury facilities built into the subterranean space. We might look at the, the obsession of the likes of Elon Musk with the Hyperloop idea of again taking, um, taking away from the surface and burrowing beneath it for sort of high-end mobility systems. We might look at the efforts that are going in to produce supersonic private planes which are very much on the cards in the near future we might look at the well well discussed discussion um, phenomenon of helicopter commuters in uh, in cities like sao paulo where again the ground is left behind entirely and at the uh, far extreme we might look at the the obsession with space inner space travel either as a form of commuting or as a as a um as the the starting point for space colonization. And this is something that the, the super wealthy oligarchs of the likes of Bezos and Musk and Branson are in this sort of macho, um, macho race to try and launch their own space exploration platforms. So what I would stress is that we, uh, we very much need to see the experience of uh, luxury towers and the, their, their proliferation within this wider politics of volumetric secession, if you like. Um, and I think there's the end conclusion is that we really need to start taking these um, connected secessional tendencies together and pushing them within a much more critical treatment of the volume of, of urban space. So I'll finish there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Stephen, for such a stimulating and visually stunning talk. Um, I'm sure that's bound to generate a really rich discussion. So we have until about half past for questions and comments. So as a reminder, you're welcome to either activate your camera and microphone to ask a question directly, or you can submit a question through the chat, which I'll read aloud. Um, so to ask a question directly, you can move your cursor to the participants tab. Uh, which is in the Zoom menu at the bottom of your screen. And then you select raise hand, uh, at which point uh, we'll prompt you to then turn on your microphone. Uh, and to maximize participation and hear from as many people as possible, we'll take questions in groups of three. Okay, fabulous. Um, so I see Kurt uh, followed by Yubin, and then hopefully that'll uh, give time for somebody else to come forward. Go ahead, Kurt. Thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, I'm Kurt Keeney. I'm a sociology doctoral student uh, at, at Wisconsin. Um, I have to say, I'm, I'm a huge fan of your work and have been for a long time. I, for many years, I was very frustrated with the fact that, as you say, our language is very vertical, uh, but our social science, it seems to me, is, is not very attentive to the vertical uh, very much at all. Um, and I, I often wondered how do people even begin to understand cities like Rio or like Hong Kong or like Singapore, where I spend a lot of time without a careful attention to literally physical stratification of the, of the city and its classes. Uh, my question is, is maybe an obvious one, so I'd welcome others to add their own nuances to this, but I'm wondering in the context of the ongoing pandemic, um, where there's now more of a premium, I think, on, on sort of horizontal square footage and that kind of space um, because people are, are confined. Um, and where the elevator or lift is a little bit more problematic, um, I, I wonder what you've been thinking about uh, these dynamics of verticality uh, during the pandemic and in the wake of the pandemic as as sort of social distancing measures, et cetera, um, may influence the, the architecture of, of these luxified spaces. Thanks. Are, there, are we gonna take any more? 
or, or would you like me to respond to Kurt? Completely uh, different to you. I think um, Yubin is in the queue, but if you'd like to respond directly, go ahead. Okay, I will with this one, if that's okay. Um, I think well, clearly this is an ongoing situation. I mean, the, there's a sense even before the pandemic that the, in London anyway, that the, the whole push towards the luxury high A rise um, is faltering. It's faltering because um, the, the flows of capital are not there as they were. It's faltering because of the backlashes to, against the, the unoccupied towers and, and so on. And in New York, it's faltering because of the, some of the experiences of the towers, of, as I say, being problematic. But I think you're right that the elevator becomes a real Achilles heel in, the, in a post-pandemic situation. Um, one of the reasons the housing towers are attractive to developers is that they need fewer elevators than commercial towers you know if you imagine a whole a tower full of office block office workers you need an awful lot more elevators than you do so so, so many of these residential towers have literally two elevators and uh, that's a really big challenge in terms of uh, pandemic safe operation and they given the way aerosols are really pivotal to that i think there's a lot of people scratching their heads to think through how can uh, how can you have uh, covid safe elevator systems at all so it's an it's an in, it will be an absolutely fascinating thing to watch um and to to see how do you you can't really retrofit more elevators into towers you you're going to have to work with what's there and the economics um becomes very challenging if you can literally just move one or two people in an elevator that was uh, was that was going to be full you know these things are very carefully calculated and um a commercial tower for sure is is not going to be able to function without full elevators they are they are designed to be at capacity but it's hard to imagine a better means of sustaining covid transmission than literally pushing as many people into an elevator as possible and let, letting it go up and down a building all day long. Thanks, Kurt, that was a great question. Wonderful, Yubin, and then I believe Patrick Barrett wanted to ask a question afterwards as well. Hi, um, thank you so much for the great talk. I. Uh, I'm, out, I'm also a sociology grad student and um, also similar to Kurt, really uh, love your work um, because I study subways and global cities mm -hmm. um, and I loved your uh, splintering urbanism book. So thank you for coming here. It's uh, 4 a.m. in Seoul. <laughs> really? I'm, I'm going to, uh, yes. Um, uh, and, and also thank you for your talk. I had a I was thinking about this and had um, a few questions um, slash uh, points to make. Um, I'm in Seoul right now and uh, Seoul is also a global city. Um, it also has income inequalities and so on, but um, unlike New York or, uh, or London and such where it's kind of like a mountain of you know, there are all these low rises and then these high rises in the central city um, where the fire sectors are located. Um, in cities like Seoul that were developed um, uh, later on in, uh, in world history in the 70s and 80s, uh, catered towards middle and working class populations and laborers coming uh, to provide labor for the export driven industry, a lot of the housing here are actually high high rises um, and all the rich people live in nice homes with spacious uh, yards and fields in, in low rises. And of course there are skyscrapers, but um, I also found this to be true in places like Switzerland um, where uh, all the high rises were for, you know, all social housing, um, and, and you mentioned some of that, but in terms of uh, their failures and, uh, and this actually was a policy of trying to fit as many people um, in a vertical space and for sustainability reasons, et cetera. And I'm wondering whether it's not 
whether th there is a clear, you know, linear relationship between verticality and um, and uh, class stratification, or uh, and also I'm I'm wondering um, whether it's uh, you know necessarily the the physical that's um, kind of an outcome uh, of the social conditions and and planning in a way uh, that like Seoul being a majority like middle class oriented city versus other places with higher income polarization. Um, maybe I could take that one, Sarah. Is that okay? Thanks. Thanks very much, Yubin. Um I should say that the vertical books just come out in Korean, by the way. So I'm really pleased about that. Um, the uh, I think it's worth emphasizing that um, in many cities around Asia in particular, the norm of life is high rise and uh, the norm of life is not necessarily these luxury towers. So I haven't emphasized that in, in my talk, but um, I think what's fascinating from the Korean example is perhaps the, the, the way in which the film Parasite was vertically structured. I'm really intrigued by that as a, uh, I mean, it, it did very much suggest a, a vertical stratification, but maybe that was just used for filmic purposes because it's a very traditional uh, idea in, in filmic and speculative fiction is to have verticalized cities. It goes right back to the history of sci-fi as well. But, um, but in many Asian cities, um, well, particularly Singapore is a great example because you have again because of the sheer land shortage you have no choice but to build high the same in hong kong the most verticalized city of all and in singapore you, know, you have a a particularly strong public sector treatment of housing you know 70 or 80 percent of people live in state provided housing um, and i think the urban design challenges in many asian cities are, I've got architects to think through, okay, we've got um, a population living in these tower blocks, but they're not very creative. You know, they are basically what they call vertical cul-de-sacs. They only connect with the city at the ground level, perhaps the subway level. And in Singapore, there's some really interesting uh, experiments with trying to connect buildings at more than those levels. You know, why not have connections that are halfway up the building to think through uh, the provision of public services or small schools or little gardens and, and play areas and so on. So, so I think uh, it's we're starting to see in the architectural debate and the urban design debate a sense of looking at multi-level connections between buildings, which I think is really creative. And it's what you don't get. You can only really do it when you have a very strong state control because developers are just going to do the bog standard cheap um, cookie cutter housing towers in Chinese cities are a great example of that as well. But thanks so much for the question. Okay, next we have Patrick Barrett followed by Jenna. Hey Steve. Um, Hi. That was, I agree with everyone else who's spoken that that was a really fabulous talk, super interesting. Um, and unlike Hurt or Yuvan, I'm no expert in this area. I just, you know, have a somewhat morbid fascination with it following it in the, New York, in the New York Times and witnessing things like up close Billionaire's Row or Hudson Yards are uh, really atrocious developments. Um, I, I guess what I'm curious about is the degree to which there's a pushback against this either in the architectural profession or you know in groups like Right to the City, the degree to which um, they've been at all effective. Um, I'm, I'm also reminded of this film that came out, I think it was 2012, Human Scale, which featured the um, Danish architectural firm uh, Jan Gale, I believe is the way to pronounce it, um, that there were efforts in a variety of different, particularly megalopolises around the world um, to make cities more um, human friendly. So I'm just curious about those sorts of developments. Thanks. Thanks. Um, thanks, Patrick. It's uh, it's a great question. I I I think, to be honest, too, too much, too much, far too many of the architect, the key architects around the world are profiting from this phenomenon. They are feeding at the trough of this phenomenon. 
because as I say, the developers are very often trying to get Starkitects in because it's part of the premium allure, right? You can, you can say uh, that this tower is designed by Norman Foster or by, by Renzo Piano or, or whatever. Um, having said that, there are socially critical fringes of the architectural world. And I mentioned one, the Architects for Social Housing, who are robustly trying to fight against the wholesale demonization of vertical social housing. And in, in the UK, they, they're gaining influence, but um, in the absence of uh, changes at, at the policy level, um, we're still seeing this violent process of erasure going in, even by left-wing councils. What's startling is the way in which Labour municipalities in London are completely complicit in the destruction of these, these estates. Um, and there's all sorts of questions about whether the financial inducements of the development are pushing them to do this because of the wider financial crises that many local governments have. So, so yeah, there are some uh, creative and powerful socially organized urban movements around the world who are contesting this stuff. Whether or not it's been um, fully pushed back, I don't think so. But I think, as we said, with the wider sort of COVID and pandemic related changes. I think the, the energy of these shifts is, is certainly dissipating. So that maybe there's more scope uh, in the future for, for changing direction. Um, and I think the argument really is that in many cities, you, you need to house the people that run the city. You know, if, if there is no housing for the, for the teachers, for the fire workers, for the nurses, for the people who effectively maintain and run your city, your city ceases to function effectively. And I think that's an argument that many people have in New York as well. Yeah. Wonderful. So uh, Jenna followed by Revel. Hi Jenna. Hi there. Am I unmuted? Now we can hear you. Oh, okay, you can, great. Um, thank you for your talk, um, it's great to see you. Um, I was really taken with um, your comments on, so the cartography that we have with the God's eye view, ironically doesn't prepare us for this vertical view. And then um, at the same time, so much of the visuality of, um, and the power sort of derived from living in these high, spaces does sort of come from this God's eye view, a sense of being able to look down upon everybody. So I wonder your thoughts on um, sort of critical, um, critical visualities that can help us get at that. So you gave us some cross sections, which are always sort of fabulous, but I wonder some other of your thoughts on critical visualities, because I too was struck by time geographies being apparently volumetric, but, but not but not really. And that's such a cool area of geography. So thank you. Um, can I take that, Sarah? Yeah, I think I think the oblique view is perhaps the most powerful. There's, there's, Hong Kong is the most verticalized city in the world. And um, it's it's not just the towers in Hong Kong. You've got raised walkways, you've got the plinths, you've got subways and so on. Um, and a traditional map in Hong Kong is pretty much useless. I mean, you want to try navigating around the central area of Hong Kong with a traditional flat map. Um, you basically, you, you end up with very much a sort of Frederick Jameson or Ed Soja type of experience of wandering lost into hotel foyers and then moving into corporate HQs and malls and so on, because they are laced together by elevators and walkways and so on. So there's an incredibly powerful book produced called Cities with City Without Ground by a bunch of architects in Hong Kong. I, I haven't got any images to show you, but they use the oblique view. So rather than the section, they're actually looking at the, the, the three-dimensional world of Hong Kong from a sort of 45 degree angle, which is incredibly powerful. And they, they are able to show all of the laced um, elevators, escalators, walkways, 
um, multiple levels of walkway systems and plinths and towers, and then going into the subterranean stuff as well. So that is the most creative bit of th uh, three-dimensional cartography that I've come across so far. Highly recommend that. It's fantastic. Yeah. But I think, again, critically, that could be a very powerful tool, you know, to actually map cities in three dimensions obliquely as a means of revealing the sort of power geometries it, to use Dorian Massey's term of these multiple levels and interconnecting mobility systems yeah wonderful thank you um and just before I turn it over to Revel there was just a request in the chat to put the name of the book for participants reference but go ahead Revel yeah I'll see if I can uh, find a, a web link for it as well. Great. And Revel, I, I don't believe we can hear you. Do you mind testing your audio once more? OK. Hi. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No, I, I, thank you, Steve, for such a, a really insightful talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, and I, I want to. Uh, Follow up a little bit on, on Patrick's question, um, and, and and frame it in the context of, of you know the the politics of of, uh, of looking down. And I'm wondering about your thoughts of sort of the reverse of that, right? You know, the politics of looking up, and some of the discourses that we have uh, around sort of social movements and urban space. And I'm particularly thinking here of the right to the city framework. And I just want to hear your thoughts on on that framework uh, and its possibility. Uh, for thinking vertically. Uh, I don't know if, if we've sort of incorporated uh, uh, this type of uh, analysis into, you know, the sort of social movements built around this. I mean, there's a lot of appropriation of space and right to participation, of course. Uh, but, you know, how does that translate to, to the verticalities that you're presenting here? Um, that's a great question. I, I, I think, um, again, the first point to stress is that the language of contestation is again a vertical language you know you rise up you stand up for something um, so linguistically and etymologically it's uh, it's it's very much a vertical register you, you know striving for horizontalized societies rather than a sense of highly verticalized hierarchies you know the zapatistas actually used to talk about horizontalism as an objective you know so so that's the first thing to stress the second thing i'd stress is that actually speculative fiction and sci-fi are very interesting one of my great regrets is that the publisher um, took out a chapter on science fiction from the vertical book which i which i which i wish i'd uh, insisted on keeping because it was an analysis of how the history of sci-fi is is profoundly vertically stratified and that's the sort of trope that dominates urban sci-fi going right back to hg wells obviously fritz lang's metropolis and um jg ballard's high rise and blade runner and all the cyberpunks it's very much a sense of downtrodden minions in the subways and on the street level rising up to contest the the city's uh, elites who are of, often succeeded away in bastions of the tops of towers or in some sci-fis like Elysium they're even off world altogether um, and I'm fascinated by the way sci-fi relates to the practices of urban design and urban speculation in in the sort of quote unquote real world because um the production of futuristic cityscapes is, is a specific sort of effort of many elites. I mean, in Dubai and the Gulf and in places like Shanghai, there's a sense that we're not necessarily seeing the future rather than a retro future. We're seeing a sort of historic 60s, 70s pop sci-fi vision of the, the, the towers and the landscapes and so on. And that's no accident, actually, because... Well, for example, the architect who designed the Burj Khalifa, he works for a big company in Chicago. Um, he actually was inspired, he said he was inspired by the Emerald City and the Wizard of Oz when he, when he created that super thin um, structure. And the guy that designed the, this, the film set for Blade Runner, a guy called Sid Mead, 
um, he calls himself a visual futurist. He actually goes around the Gulf selling his services on how to look like the future. So, so the elites in Dubai uh, that are very carefully trying to meld themselves to look like the future. And then they become the sets for the next levels of sci-fi movies, you know, like um, uh, there's been a load of movies set in Dubai, you know. Was it, um, who was the author of Cyberspace? Oh my goodness me, I'm thinking, William Gibson. William Gibson famously said, uh, the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. So, so there's a really interesting question about uh, retro and real futurism and how that how that blurs into questions of filmic and comic and video game based representations plus actual architecture which I think is really fascinating so thanks mm -hmm. for the question we do have a few more minutes for questions um, if folks feel more comfortable writing their questions in the chat, we welcome you to do that. Um, we do have one related question from the chat. Um, so Stephen, you might be forced to just sort of elaborate at length on the same kind of theme, but um, could you talk a bit more about the spatiality of class struggle? How might this affect how people mobilize, form relationships and resist? Well, I think um, going back to the linguistic thing, I think it's always important because we, we use vertical metaphors unknowingly. We, we forget to think of them as metaphorical. And this is really important. You know, why, why in the social sciences do we, do, we, do we use words like lower class and upper class? You know, why do we, why do we depict them in, in vertical terms? Um, and I think uh, perhaps we can start to look at our own language um, in terms of struggles against verticalized, uh, hierarchized societies. Um, struggles for horizontalized organizations and so on and um, and I think that's a really linguistic register is really important so that's a short answer for that one that's fabulous um, I'll just give people a moment if they'd like to ask any concluding questions or make any comments if anybody's interested in the sci-fi piece, I'm happy, I'd be very happy to send it to you and maybe you could circulate it if, if people are interested. Um, it's very, it was published as a separate article in uh, a journal called City. Wonderful, I'm seeing a lot of uh, enthusiastic yeses in the, in the chat, so that would be cool. wonderful. So I suppose if you would like to make any closing remarks, uh, feel free to do so unless we see anyone's hand pop up at any point. Um, I, there's nothing that appeared that springs to mind, I must be honest. Um, I think I've pretty much said what I wanted to say. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, that was extremely concise and gives us a lot of food for thought. So thank you so much for a fabulous first lecture in our series. And, and just to remind everyone, so on March 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, uh, we're thrilled to host uh, Professor Robin D.G. Kelly um, at, from UCLA for a set of three talks entitled Black Bodies Swinging in American Postmortem. Uh, and they're all at 12.30 p.m. Central Time. Uh, you can find more information and a link to the registration page on our website. Um, I'd also like to announce that the International Sociological Association's virtual meeting next week will feature two panels honoring Eric Olin Wright. Uh, the first is on Wednesday, February 24th at 2.45 p.m. Central Time, and it's entitled The Life and Work of Eric Olin Wright. And the second on Thursday, February 25th at 7.45 a.m. Central Time, uh, which is a bit early, but absolutely worth it, um, discusses empirical work on labor struggles and community alliances, drawing on Eric's class analytic tradition. Um, and our very own Pete Ramond is presenting a